The future is here already. It's just not evenly distributed. Yet. Today's world teams with innovation. The nexus of hardware, software, and human ingenuity promises a revolution in possibilities. What does tomorrow look like? Witness Future Proof. Yes, indeed, you're truly Eric Cavanaugh here. <clears throat> and folks, I'm so excited to have an all-star cast for you today of experts in streaming and streaming technology. So we're going to talk to Timothy Spann and David Kiramgard of Stream Native and Paul Brebner is nice enough to call in from the other side of the planet with a company called InstaCluster. But let's just talk, first of all, what do we mean by streaming? So a lot of folks, of course, think of streaming in terms of Netflix for your movies or Spotify for your music. Uh, and this is one of these interesting cases where the consumer world really maps very tightly to the enterprise world. Usually there's uh, innovation in one that comes to the other and it seemed to be fairly concurrent no pun intended, in terms of uh, how this happened in the enterprise world with streaming data. So there's Apache Kafka, of course, which a lot of people know about. It's a very popular a company called Confluent sits on top of that. I've talked to those guys quite a few times over the years, but there are other streaming technologies as well. Flink, Apache Flink is one, and Pulsar is another as well. And the gentleman on the call today, two of them know a lot about that. Uh, and they all know a lot about streaming in general. So what is streaming? If you think about the history of data and data management and what we've been doing with data in the analytic space in particular, the model has always been the same until the recent past, meaning you capture some data somewhere, you persist it in some sort of enterprise system, and then typically you would take it from there and put it into what's called an enterprise data warehouse. So companies like Teradata, obviously, but also Vertica and quite a few others, Paracel, was one interesting one for a while that got bought. <clears throat> That's now Amazon Redshift. Um, but the point is that you would grab data, capture data, persist it somewhere, and then analyze it in that analytical engine, like your Teradata or whatever. There are lots and lots of analytic engines these days. But streaming is a different story entirely. So with streaming, you can actually analyze the data as it's flying across the transom. So you're looking at data in motion, which is obviously much more timely and very powerful for certain use cases. Now, there are times when you don't have to worry about that, obviously, but streaming data really poses tremendous opportunity and some architectural challenges to be sure. You have to know how to hook all these things up to get it to work properly. But uh, streaming data is very compelling, it's very powerful, and it's really reshaping the industry. And so I've kind of wondered to myself, are we going to see streaming analytics services replacing traditional offline style processing like we saw in Teradata and these other engines? Or is it just gonna be new use cases? Will it be some balance of the two? I'm quite sure it's, it's that last, it's gonna be both, right? But our experts today are gonna to tell us all about that. So without further ado, let me bring in Tim Spann from a company called Stream Native. Tim, tell us a bit about yourself and Stream Native and uh, what you do with streaming and how you help people get good ideas and make things happen. Sure, I'm Tim Spann. I'm a developer advocate at Stream Native, which uh, my role, I'm trying to help everyone out there in the open source at different companies in the uh, community work with Pulsar and the related technologies, whether you're uh, just learning, coming over from something else, trying to integrate it with a uh, different technology. You know, it's, it's pretty exciting. I came from uh, a more traditional data background. I was at Hortonworks and I started to adopt uh, streaming when we started to make that difficult switch from batch to streaming and you know uh, lots of different ideas over the last five ten years of you know when is something a batch when is it a micro batch when is it a stream <laughs> i mean you could spend a month on that and it, it certainly has changed as we've uh, gone uh, for the last couple of years and with the horsepower out there, with the ability to instantly spin things up in so many different clouds, you know, Kubernetes, all these things that have made, you know, more bandwidth out there, more computing power. You know, it's just, there's a, you know, impetus to get these things done faster because it fought 10 years ago, 
you know, people were fine. You order something and eventually it shows up. Now people have a phone and it's like, uh, why is it not here yet? I ordered it a minute ago. So there's the, the whole culture has sped up. I think culture streaming. So how could the data not be? Yeah. You know, I saw that at Cloud Era, and then when I jumped over to Stream Native, I'm like this is the time, the the need to have data right away, not just get it and have it land somewhere, but to be able to make those decisions on data, you know, as soon as it's created, as soon as it's born from wherever it's born, and now it's phone, it's how many devices a device now for ten bucks can be streaming. You know, events to you every sub second. I, I have customers, you know, that have tens of thousands of sources of data just streaming constantly. And sure, some of it can be, you know, wait for an hour for a batch, but a lot of it is I need to know what that event's doing this second in case uh, something's broken, something's overheated, or, you know, I want to buy something. I want to, get on top of that you see people competing to try to get things before they sell out the things are selling out in seconds for uh, tickets and so many other things you know can you imagine you had to wait oh uh we're gonna submit your ticket batch and in an hour we'll see who uh was able to purchase that uh, there would be, <laughs> be riots in the street at this point you see what happened when a cloud goes down for a couple of hours you know people aren't yeah. people aren't accepting that anymore yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point, and you picked up a number of different uh, observations there. One of which is the interdependencies in the cloud, right? And when you have all these interdependencies, you better make sure that everything is working, because if one bit goes down, guess what? Like the other bits are going to go down as well, right? So that's I think that's one of the drivers to make it happen, right? Yeah, and no, that that's something that's. Uh something that i latched on to that i really liked in the design of pulsar i came from like i said cloud era and we had things like nifi and kafka and spark and uh, flink and they all have a lot of advantages but there's something unique about pulsar in uh, some of the open source uh that's in there that i really think solves some of these issues like you mentioned well, what happens when something goes down? How do you, you know, connect and uh, interface with all these different things? How do you handle, you know, things like geo replication? You know, you want to be cloud native now because, you know, whether you're running Kubernetes or in any of these clouds, you got to keep things uh, separate. You could scale them independently. And mm -hmm. Pulsar is unique in that that the part that interfaces with all the clients is different from the part that does storage. So you can independently scale those. That's to me, that's, that's a, you know, table stakes now, because I might have a million different people accessing the same data and it could be from any number of clouds or regions. And I can't really worry. Okay. If I scale up a broker, now I've got to copy data over there. Or, you know, do I want to pay for a heavyweight node that has a huge amount of storage when all I really need to do is, you know, talk to uh, different clients and consumers of data? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. There's a, we don't have time for that anymore. Yeah, you know? well, that's a, that's a good way to put it, right? We don't have time for those, um, for those lapses, for that latency. And uh, you know, you're reminding me of some of the, the interesting aspects of streaming, right? Because you, you think about the history of computing and I'm always trying to look back and see how we got here, where the, where the inflection points were. We've had message queues forever, MQ series, and you know that's somewhat similar, but like with a Kafka and a Pulsar and these other new engines, really you could learn from all the mistakes of the past 30 years, or not even mistakes, but just the inadequacies or the shortcomings, right? Because every every computer program, every application you write is going to have its kernel, and then you kind of build around that. And if you don't think through that kernel thoroughly enough, that's when you have to go back and do a rewrite, and that's very painful to do. So I think that the open source community, in particular, really in you know like around 2010, it really started to take off, and I think the Hadoop was a big part of that. Of course, that being open sourced, right? And I actually remember too that. Uh, 
that whole that whole decade was filled with companies spawned by former Yahoo engineers. <laughs> right? I, I can't say that's not us either. <laughs> I mean, uh, Pulsar came out of uh, some early uh, Yahoo stuff around 2012. So <laughs> we, yeah. the, the legacy of uh, the people coming out of Yahoo is pretty extensive. The same with Google and all the cloud people because they built this incredible infrastructure you know, that needed to be shared with the world once everyone caught up. Wow. You know? That's a good way to put it. Well, let's bring in our next guest. David Kiramgard is uh, waiting patiently back there also with Stream Native, also deep in the fabric here of streaming as a technology. So David, tell us a bit about yourself and your take on streaming and why it's really taking off. Sure, thank you. So I'm David Kiramgard. I'm also a developer advocate at Stream Native. Uh, Stream Native is the company um, behind uh, the has the gravitational force around Apache Pulsar. There's other committers, other com companies involved, but we're uh, our CTO came from Yahoo. He's our you know driving the production and support of that company. We want to be the you know, what is what Confluent is to Kafka, Stream Native is to Pulsar. I'll put it that way. I'm also the author of Pulsar in Action, which was just released, and I just did a webinar last week about to help people get productive and get some hands-on experience with that. But I think um, to piggyback on, on on what my you know my what what, what Tim said was you know and and kind of what you said is you know i look at it you know it's it's an evolution of data data you know how do we get here you have to look back and figure out where we came from the messaging cues came along you know from the single era and you know just having a single and that was also the era from uh, you know it, co it came from the confluence of you know you had had the the uh the the distributed computing era open source came along and all these things came to be and the streaming came, you know, was made possible because you had the you know, ability to store large amounts of data for the first time up until, you know, the 20, you know, 2011 and, you know, the 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 whole Hadoop era and, where, and Kafka actually was invented to store Hadoop logs, ironically enough. So it all kind of leads back to Hadoop in a way it was built there to do that <laughs> to some extent. Or that's that's the story of, of what it was designed to do. Uh, but then so, so immediately, you, you immediately had, you know, un, unbounded storage. And then, so you could keep these messages for longer than you know than a, than a couple seconds, as long as it took to hand off to all the different consumers and clear up space for incoming data. And once you had this data, you know you could keep it for you know a couple of days or a couple of weeks. And say, hey, this is kind of interesting. Let's figure out how to analyze this as it occurs, you know, sequentially. And that really became the concept of, of stream processing. Right? I think we can process it in the exact order that it occurred, you know, mm -hmm. as you know, and mimic what happened, you know, like you know, like things like 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 an event replay or things like that. We can rerun those events through these models and, and see how how everything acted. And so that's that sort of ushered in, you know, the stream processing era. And that's kind of kind of where you know where we are today. And so I really find that very, you know, exciting. You know, to your point, um, it solves a lot of problems that weren't you know, that 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 you couldn't solve before. It solves a lot of challenges that that Tim brought up about real time. You know, to, you know, data, things like that, you know, you, you and I might have a smartwatch or something that monitors our health and we need to, you know, that data can be sent up to the doctor in real time or you can do analytics on it on a per, you know, per person basis, but you can also track it and compare you and have historical data and see how do other people in my cohorts, you know, my same demographics, you know, is, is this heart rate high, is this low, am I trending, how am I trending, so historical data has a nice blending together with, with the real time data to give you true value, give you a perspective on things. That you couldn't really have with the, you know the static traditional batch yeah. processes. It's a really nice uh, blending of the two technologies. Yeah, no, that's it's really cool stuff, and it opens up all sorts of new use cases, right? I mean, that's really the the battlefront for software engineers and designers and companies that sell software is you identify a gap or an opportunity, you build something out, and then you have to understand your use cases and evangelize that to the world right and and get that out there what are what are some of the more prevalent you just gave a couple of course but what are some of the other more prevalent use cases for streaming in the enterprise and large organizations sure large organization you know and anywhere in the iot space we have large volumes of data and you need to react to it in real time as close as you can get to physical hardware is, is, a, is a is a really good use case you know so you're doing you know you have you know production you know for you know preventive maintenance like you know, have oil and gas fields. You're trying to identify, hey, well, I'm drilling down to the ground. Is, is that drill bit going to explode, or something going to blow up down there? I need to stop it in real time. You need to have that data and act on it very quickly. Things right. like that. Uh, connected car, just the volume of data coming in, you know, from from connected car is is another good example. We have so much data coming in off our vehicles. Now you have self driving cars. I'm sure that will be that will eventually be once we're able to do it and all have you know, hey, my smart car can I talk to your smart car and let it know, hey, I'm going to be hitting the brakes here in a second. 
Right. <laughs> let tell my car to stop, you know, because of that would be, you know, great. It's fantastic. No more, a lot less accidents. So just, it, it, it brings about, you know, what is, what is possible. Um, you know, think of the holiday spirit. Another one I'm thinking, you know, and Tim kind of mentioned you order something now and you wait for it to come. Well, I get, and I'm tracking my Amazon packages in real time. It, it's actually, you know, six doors away when that truck stops and tells me it can update, my, you know, update this things in real time. So even, you know, uh, you know, all these different industries can have a unique use case for this. They just, you know, they haven't thought about it yet or they're, if they haven't already, they're, they, they really need to think about it because the data is there. The customer service experience is much better when you can process that data in real time and, and generate real business value from it for sure. Yeah, the, the customer experience one is huge, right? To be able to set up feeds, right? Kafka, for example, works with topics, but to be able to set up feeds to the important systems that need the information. So you're not, and what's cool is it's sort of a hub and spoke, right? It's It starts here, but it can go anywhere as opposed to the traditional, just point to point back and forth kind of um, relationship. Now you can replicate that data into different systems. So as orders come in, for example, you can set up a stream to go, of course, to the warehouse to tell those people, but also to go to the marketing people, to go to the sales people. I mean, I wish some of these, uh, I, I wish the uh, sort of OMA, the Omnicorp would come along that the onion joked about when all corporations merge into Omnicorp. If you've ever read that story, it's pretty funny. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, if you could get a feed to where, when I get an advertisement for something online, I buy it, for the next two weeks, I'm getting ads for the same thing. I'm like, guys, I already bought it. <laughs> right, right, yeah. But I know it'd be hard to persist back, but wow, what a great use case that would be, right? Now, and you're not wasting advertisement on someone who already bought this product, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now that would be, you know, one of those one of those example use cases. It's it's all this data. So it's the data set. It's the whole data mesh concept coming to be. We have these different data sets and who can, you know, make it available as a service almost. What data, what information do you have that's valuable? What information do I have that's valuable? The way that you know Pulsar handles things, we also use topics, but we have you know regex subscriptions, so you can actually say, "I'm interested in all the orders, everything on this whole, all these channels that match this," and so you can do a different sort of processing on that, doing analytics like how many people are buying sporting goods, or how many people are buying electronics or whatever. But you can also track, you know, you know iPhone sales in real time or iPhone sales by region or whatever. Right. Who's using it? And start getting okay. to really micro focus targeting things that, that 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 they're looking for and bring that value. talking today with several experts in streaming and data streaming, which is an absolutely fascinating subject area. Uh, we talked at the top of the hour about the old model where you would persist data in a database somewhere, and then that's when you would start using it for your applications. The difference here is that is with streaming solutions, you can access the data, you can analyze the data, you can use the data while it's moving. So it's coming across the transom. You can think like um, the, the stock market tickers, for example, there is a great opportunity for being able to leverage these kinds of real-time capabilities to see what's happening. But we heard some great examples from David and Tim in the opening segment about just staying on top of, of what's happening, staying on top of inventory, for example, Christmas time is coming, right? How many widgets do you have left in the warehouse? Being able to, to capture a stream early in the game too, if you have enough data and can build a predictive model, that can help you understand planning, like forecasting, for example. You can tell from early sales in a particular region, oh, this is gonna be hot in that region. There's not, no sales over here, why not? Well, we don't know yet but don't ship any stuff there because they're not even buying the stuff we already shipped them, right? I mean, these are these are simple things, but they're extremely complicated in terms of being able to tackle unless and until you have the streaming capability, at which point it becomes a lot easier to do that sort of stuff. So it's great for optimizing, for driving down costs, for driving down delivery times, and hey, we're in a supply chain crisis right now. So pretty good stuff to solve some of those problems. Uh, and the folk, our guest next up knows a bit about all that. Paul Brebner is with a company called InstaCluster. Paul, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what you think about the whole world of streaming data and streaming analytics. Hi, thanks, Eric. Um, so I'm Paul Brebner. I'm the really the open source tech evangelist at InstaCluster. I'm based in Canberra, but our company is global. We have um, customers everywhere, lots in the US, and they're all working in sort of different uh, sectors, um, often mission critical, uh, like banking, finance, retail, delivery, industrial, startups, even gaming. So they've cut across a lot of the use cases that the other panelists have mentioned already today. 
Um, so we actually started out with Apache Kafka. Uh, but when I started with the company four years ago, we were just bringing uh, Apache, sorry, uh, Apache Cassandra. But when I joined four years ago, we um, were in the process of adding Apache Kafka. So it was an opportunity for me to start learning a whole new technology, a streaming technology. Um, so what I spend most of my time doing is actually learning some of the new technologies we um, bring on board, um, build interesting sort of demonstration applications, blog about them, and occasionally get to uh, give talks and you know, participate in shows like this. This is very exciting. Um, so over the last few years, actually, with Kafka in particular, I've built some demo applications for IoT logistics. That was the first one I built. Um, that was sort of like an Amazon clone. Um, another one I did recently was an, a sort of real-time anomaly detection system. So that was one that massively scaled up to 19 billion anomaly checks a day. It was a very large wow. system uh, that scaled really, really well. And there's another example, if we get time, I'll mention later on, which is a sort of a, an, an open source streaming data pipeline um, that I've spent the last 12 months working on as well. But I really like the title of this particular show, You Can Step in the Same Stream Twice. Um, so I thought the idea of pitting two philosophers against each other, Heraclitus <laughs> and Kafka, was a really interesting one. Um, so that's what I thought I'd, I'd sort of focus on that aspect. So that yeah, please, stepping in the same stream twice actually sounds like one of the Kafka superpowers that I really like, which is <laughs> Kafka's ability to replay events. Um, so Kafka enables event replaying by default. So unlike some of the other earlier messaging systems that you mentioned earlier, it doesn't throw events away once they're delivered once. It actually keeps them around basically for as long as you like. So this means that the same event can be received by the same consumer more than once. So this is a bit like, this is called event replaying. Uh, it's a bit like watching this show afterwards on the podcast. So you can actually watch it as many times as you like. But the other mm -hmm. aspect I think of event um, replaying, which is critical as well in distributed systems and enterprises, is the ability to replicate the same event to multiple different consumers at the same time. So that's more like the fan out or broadcasting use case, which is actually what we're doing live right. at the moment as well. So that's quite interesting uh, metaphor. Right. Well, it's it's interesting because if you think about, again, how, how did we get here, right? Um, we've always had data in the, in the data world, in the computing world, you've had data moving around in different capacities. Uh, but it used to be that the pipes were very thin, the processors were slow and storage was expensive and all that changed. Now the processors are fast, the pipes are fat, the storage is cheap. So that whole game changed. But what you just mentioned, I find very interesting of just setting up all these data as a service type feeds because it's no skin off the, the provider's back, basically. You're spitting out three streams or five or seven instead of just one of the same information. Different people are, are subscribing to those feeds to get it. But like uh, David was saying, if you have all these different sources of information, you choose you know, some from our retail stream, some from uh, market data, for example, and you bring it all together to, to better understand what are the possibilities, what, how many widgets could I reasonably sell in this period? You can answer all sorts of questions in an informed way if you have the data and you don't have to be walking around with floppy disks like we did in the old days, right? That's true. I remember floppy disks, <laughs> even the eight inch ones. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, look, so I think, I mean, there's a couple of different use cases around um, the event replaying in Kafka. This one I'll mention briefly uh, is Kafka Mirror Maker. So that's one that's really quite useful for the geographically distributed use case. Um, so it's quite a common use case these days. A lot of companies work internationally. Uh, you want to be able to make sure that if some event happens in one place, it's actually available in your whole, whole ecosystem everywhere around the world, potentially. Uh, it's also great if, if you lose a data center, the data is not just in one place. So it's really good right. for high availability systems. But it's all, also really good for low latency systems where you just have to have the data really near where you're actually going to be processing it. So one of my um, one of my demo use cases I'm actually working on at the moment is a is a globally distributed uh, low latency, high frequency financial um, application for stock market trading. So that's one I'm in the process of building at the moment. Hmm. Um, so that's that's quite an important use case for the Kafka event replaying. Um, as I've been building some of these systems, I found that being able to re replay events is really useful for development as well, like for testing, uh, for load testing and things. If you've got all the events in your Kafka topic already, um, while you're actually trying to debug a system and test it out to make sure that some of the downstream systems actually work correctly, which often takes quite a bit of effort, you've got the same data there. You can actually use it multiple times. 
Um, and particularly useful for load testing. I've, I've used that quite regularly to make sure that the downstream systems can actually cope with the, the, the data that I know is already in Kafka um, and the expected load that I would expect the downstream systems to be able to cope with. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of, lot of use cases sort of around the whole DevOps part of the, the story as well, which is quite powerful, I think. But then finally, I mean, the, the really important one is the fan out one where you've got multiple consumers of the data and you've got to be able to integrate uh, multiple systems together and particularly with multiple different heterogeneous downstream systems. So Kafka Connect is the sort of the, the, the main Kafka API that's really useful for that. Um, so that's the one I've been playing around with for, for the last 12 months as well. Yeah, that's cool. And, you know, when I think about um, replaying events, as you suggest, and, and you're right that I was uh, getting philosophical with that title there. <laughs> um, what, what I find very compelling from uh, a discovery perspective and an analytical perspective is time series. Right, time series data because you can you can watch it. It's always a question of where you put the markers. Where does the cycle begin? Where does it end? That you're trying to understand. And if you can replay things again and again, you can kind of watch and see what's really happening. Because I think that's when you have the sort of aha moment is when you're watching like a slider bar, for example, on development. There was a company in San Francisco, this is gosh, 10 years ago. I remember looking at, they had done a mashup. Remember mashups we used to talk about? Mm -hmm. But they had all of this data from the San Francisco Bay Area, from, uh, from the county, from the state, from like information about contractors and licenses and things and when houses went up. And you could just run the slider bar and kind of see the development as it happens. That's very elucidating to to watch it all pan out and then be able mm. to to go back and do it again. Because as you know, when you're watching something that's complex, there are lots of moving parts. And the first time, second time, you won't really see what's happening. Third, fourth, fifth time, now you're like, oh, I see what happened. This car ran into that rock and pulled over here, and that caused this. But you can't you can't get that from just photographs, which is like what a snapshot is, right? Just a photograph. You have to see things in motion to understand how they're moving and where they're going. So to me, that's one of the biggest, just fundamental benefits of this whole new discipline. What do you think, Paul? Oh, absolutely. So the, I, it's quite interesting, actually. It's a nice segue into the use case I've been looking at. So um, I was at a conference a year ago, a Kafka conference, and they were talking about the US CDC people building a COVID-19 COVID specific Kafka pipeline in 30 days. And I thought, wow, I could do that. Um, but I wanted to use some open source data and a slightly different, less dramatic <laughs> use case. So I decided to use the, the NOAA tidal data. Um, so the, the NOAA US weather um, people have lots of locations with very interesting real-time sensor data coming in. And there's a public API, you can consume that. So I built myself a Kafka Connect pipeline to consume that data on one side put it into Kafka and then I thought, well, what am I going to do with it? So my first experiment was actually then building the rest of the pipeline out to sync it into Elasticsearch and display it in the Kibana tool, which is for analysis and visualization. And that's precisely that sort of use case. So just seeing a single tide level at a single location doesn't actually tell you very much. What you need to be able to see is the pattern of the change right. of that, that over time. And it was really interesting immediately that I got the pipeline working uh, and the graphs were appearing in Cabana, I could see that the, the tides were actually going up, as you'd expect. I could see that they had the right sort of period, which was, I think, 24 hours and 10 minutes. The tides uh, go from maximum to maximum. And you could other, other interesting things that I didn't expect to see, I was able to map the data as well and show it geographically. And I could see that some locations actually had huge tidal ranges compared to others, which meant I was able to explore some of the, the, the less obvious features maybe of tidal data change as well. But the ability to replay was critical in that scenario as well, because um, I then decided, well, let's build another pipeline. And I put the, put the data into Postgres and used an, another Apache product, uh, Apache Superset to visualize the data. So I then had two pipelines running. Um, the same data was being used in two different ways. And again, part of the story about the replaying was being able to use that to test and develop those two yeah. systems. There were different hiccups that I encountered along the way. And I being able to reuse the same data multiple times was um, was critical to be able to debug that sort of a, a system. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic use case. I'd love to take a look at that sometime. Um, yeah, I've got I've got a, a quite a good talk on that one. It's quite a visual one. It's a bit hard to talk about on the radio, but I can, yeah. <laughs> can sort of imagine what's going on at that point. So. Right. 
No, that's cool stuff. Well, let's bring uh, our guests back in. Let's bring Tim Span back in maybe to to comment on that, on, on the use cases and the value of all of this. And as with a lot of other technologies these days, Tim, I think that part of the challenge is just changing the mindset and, and trying to kind of shatter the old version of how we did things to recognize that there's a very new and different way of doing things that is much more powerful. And, and the key really is scale. We've said that several times, being able to scale out. That's why you have ML ops these days. That's why you have data ops these days, because you want to be able to scale out quickly and, and have your audit trail and all your governance baked in so that you, you can just kind of have fun with the data. But what do you think, Tim? Yeah, certainly <laughs> to these days, scale is expected even for small companies. I mean, before you had to be someone who is, in, you know, Google, Yahoo, someone of this size to have massive data, but you can easily start bringing in, you know, millions of records a second, petabytes of data and be, uh, you know, a small time uh, company. The amount of data out there and being able to scale up, scale down, geo replicate, tier, tier out your storage. So you're not paying, you know, tremendous amount of money to keep your things and say a topic for, you know, years if you need to, whether it's petabytes or not. That's something that was pretty critical for Pulsar is having things like geo replication and tiered storage, just because our use cases we started with were were big. And I mean, we needed the data right away. And to get those people who were, you know, maybe stuck in those brownfield applications, we don't make everyone change all their code overnight right. because I worked on government projects. It could take them a decade to get off of, you know, old JMS things. So right. Pulsar has got native connectivity to older style of messaging and support for different messaging semantics. So, you know, you could just keep those same libraries you have and just start using Pulsar. And then once it's in the topic, you know, it could be used in a more modern application while not rewriting Thanks, all Steve. those applications right away. So it gives you that ability to slowly jump on the moving truck and not, uh, you know, have to stop it or not have to throw away valuable sources of data just because maybe I can't stop them. Maybe, uh, you know, I can't recompile them. You know, I can't right. use a newer library for some reason, which happens. You know what? You reminded me of one of my favorite uh, aspects about this technology in this space in particular. And I remember I actually interviewed uh, Jay Kreps probably like five or six years ago now, and I gave him this analogy. And I think it still holds true even more so today. It is a stepping stone, right? Because it's it's almost like the the highway system that we built in the 40s and 50s in the U.S. It goes up and around cities, but you can connect to it and then you get a lot faster across the country. Well, folks, don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Talking all about stream data, streaming data these days. Uh, and it's a pretty big deal. It's very exciting stuff. Lots of different open source projects. And that's frankly a whole show. We could talk about the influence of open source on how software is designed, developed, maintained, uh, brought to production, et cetera. It's a much different world now than it was 20 years ago. That's for sure. And uh, we've heard, heard the term data mesh come up a couple of times here, which uh, I find fascinating. I have been researching that in the recent past. It's a fascinating theory. Uh, of course, a paper was written a while ago, which is the sort of uh, foundation of all that. But uh, and there's there's a particular vendor that talks all about it, but it's not so much a vendor specific thing as it is a methodology and a way of viewing data management and the use of data management. It's a bit more open ended, I guess, uh, but maybe I'll bring David uh, Karamgar back in to kind of talk about that. How would you describe data mesh to a business person who has heard about it, but doesn't really know what it is versus other ways of viewing data, like data warehousing and analytics and so forth? Yeah, that's, that, that, that's actually a great question. So like a, a, a data mesh is just combinations of, you know, it's more of a, what they call your, your, your democratizing data. So it's not a centralized storage, uh, you know, source of truth, but other, everybody brings their own set or com, you know, combination of data to this individual mesh, and then they can connect you know, and, or interconnect in different ways in order to 
to gain value from the different data sets, right? So you can bring your own different data set. You know, here's here's what I know about, you know, transit data, for example, in your particular provider. And here's what I know about, you know, weather data and bring that different data set it might come in from NOAA and another one might come in from, you know, like a, uh, you know, a, a connected car vendor here. Here's, here's what we know about, you know, driver behavior. And here's what we know about telemetrics and things like that. And that all, be, you know, you can combine that in different ways and pull it from out, you know, you don't have, so you don't have to own it in one spot. You can pull it in from different, different combat, different uh, vendors and combine it together and make, make out of it, you know, the value that, 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 that you want for your business. And to me, that's kind of the long sought vision that is finally coming true, right? Cause that's what we've always wanted. And, you know, I've thought, talked again on shows over the years about data sharing across industries, for example, like in the security space, it makes a mountain of sense for big banks to share threat information with each other that strikes me as a great uh use case for data for data streaming is that about right david yeah no, i definitely that's that's that actually I, you know, is, is is a great analogy like whitelisting and blacklisting and, and, and known threats and, and and what's emerging right because i'm sure that on the other side the black hats are doing the same thing right you know when the right. log j uh, <laughs> thing was was hacked it was all over you know it was on fire on, in the, on the black ad site right They're, hey you can exploit this stuff and get at it and it was an interesting you know, how quickly the open source community was able to respond and get and get fixes out quickly and you know and, and fix that thing but it still goes back to you know showing you know the the need for that data to communicate it quickly because the threat and the and the the, the ability to act on that data quickly it has real value and has real impact and having different data sources be able to pull that in from different sources makes it you know much more critical in a business sense perspective right so those are the things that we're trying to do with these streaming data systems things you know, data platforms like like Apache Pulse are not just intended to be the old message queues of the past where you store data temporarily and, and send it point to point. It's more about you can retain this data for very long periods of time, you, you know, with, with tiered storage and, and offloading and, and infinitely scalable systems and then present it, you know, as a stream, because now the way that you process data and again, you know, with SQL, uh, you know, data warehousing engine, the stream is a natural data concept. And so to present an, an unbounded stream to analytic engines like Flink or Spark or these other systems that are designed to operate on Flinks or on, on, on streams just makes sense and they become part of that data mesh story as well. And so those capabilities have to be there in a messaging system. It's just, it just makes sense. It's the origin of data. It's the true source of data. And, you know, it's, it just makes perfect sense. Yeah. And, you know, maybe Paul, I'll bring you back quickly to talk about this and then throw it over to Tim. You know, to me, what, one of the architectural uh, achievements was getting around that so-called single point of failure. Right, you don't want to don't want to be in a situation where your entire stack is relying upon one single point of failure that could bring the whole house of cards down. And you think about something like inventory, for example. To me, this makes a lot of sense for manufacturers or suppliers to set up topics for all of its partners, downstream partners, that they can subscribe to. Because otherwise, what you were doing is you would just go to the portal where you buy your stuff and hit that database somewhere, an Oracle database maybe underneath to come back, okay, we only have 18 widgets left. You know, if once you're actually in the process of buying, you put a lock on those 18 until it expires or something. But if it's all about performance in, in the world today, right? It's all about speed and performance and getting the data you want as fast as possible. To me, that's a real significant game changer because now you don't have a single point of failure, at least not in the same sense. Uh, and you can feed many more people much more data that they can all use however they want. Is that about right, Paul? Uh, you look at, I think that's probably right. So one, one aspect, perhaps another philosophical question, is uh, did the chicken or the egg come first? And in terms of uh, events, is it, um, does the event come first or the state? So one of the things that I've been looking at recently is the use of Debezian, which is a, a way of getting data out of databases and turning it into events. So that's that's a sort of a complementary way of looking at this whole streaming system, if you like. So events don't just have to come from things that naturally produce real-time events. The events can actually come from things that are perhaps perceived as more or less static. So databases, for example. And then at that point, you can then do quite interesting transformations on that type of event data uh, and potentially feed that into other systems that, that would have a bit of a mismatch um, naturally, but you can then reuse that data in a different way and also solve some of the sort of the throughput mismatches as well. Because I mean, events are fast, whereas databases are quite slow. So there's potential um, issues around performance and um, capacity with those sort of different systems working at different speeds. But with things like with Kafka Connect, for example, you can actually address 
those types of issues, both the transformation of the data and also the, the capacity and performance. Yeah, now, this is fascinating stuff. I'll bring uh, Timothy Span back in from Stream Native. You know, I keep thinking to myself about this whole stepping stone concept. And I was mentioning in my interview with Jay Krebs, I used the analogy of the interstate highway system vis-a-vis -vis the traditional old highways like Route 66 and all the other old highways that go across America. And what do we do post-World War II? All this money went into building interstate highways. And as I recall, the whole reason was to facilitate tanks going across the country as needed if we ever got attacked by someone. They wanted infrastructure to be able to move tanks very quickly, which of course is much better on a highway than it is on some uh, you know, dirt road somewhere. Uh, but it is the stepping stone to the future. So you, you get this set up and you, know, you can tell by who uses it and where it becomes uh, very performant, et cetera, that where you get value from it. But it really, we do have to get out of these legacy systems, whether it's the databases that are now running things. Of course, mainframes are still everywhere. But if you want to be part of the new future, if you if you will, in the information economy, you need to be able to leverage these technologies and these streaming engines to me open those doors. Is that right, Timothy? Yeah, it's your accelerator, but you've got to have a lot of on ramps. Right. Uh, like right. Paul mentioned, you need something like CDC. So Pulsar does CDC, we do it with Canal and we do it with Debezium. Yeah, CDC is a big one, unlocking that potentially stuck data. Because a lot of times I want that data pushed into the stream because polling and pulling, you know, that that's a tough one. You're using a lot of resources when you don't know when something changed. Right. I mean, there's certainly ways to keep checking, but having CDC, having logs, web sockets, different things that push data from, you know, different legacy systems, whether it's mainframe, AS400, or even just older database or older apps people have written, you know, on their own. There's a lot of data locked in there, lots of different data silos. Fortunately, we've got a lot of adapters because, I mean, we've seen what came before. So, you know, whether it's coming out of, if someone pushes to JMS, we'll get that. Someone pushes to MQTT, we'll get that. You drop it in a file somewhere, we can get that. Whether like uh, Kafka has Connect, which we also support. Uh, we also have Pulsar IO and functions to bring those things in, or you use things like Flink SQL or Flink apps or Spark or NiFi. There's a lot of open source tools that kind of work together to get as much data in motion as possible. Because yeah, if, if you can't get it to the new apps you want to do, if I can't get stuff from my AS400 to uh, you know join it with data coming off a of Snowflake, I'm missing things. You know, I didn't build that database that we've been using in house for 25, 30 years and not have value in there. You know, it's been crafted and maybe it doesn't change too often. Maybe once in a while I need to do a full poll. And then while that's in a stream, analyze that against other sources of data and build up a, a golden record and then get streams after that to make sure. I mean, that's the nice thing is there's lots of different ways to do it and you don't have to, you know, boil the whole ocean to get these things warmed up and ready to go. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I came up with a good idea for our podcast bonus segment coming up next year, folks. But we are mapping out 2022 right now. Send me an email if you want to be on this show, info at dmradio.biz. That comes right to yours truly. Uh, and the podcast bonus segment is coming up next, folks. You're listening to DM Radio. I'm Andy Solomon, Motor Crash. All right, guys. Hey, thanks. Thanks out there. All right. So for the uh, podcast bonus, I had a couple of different ideas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have this idea. Let me just, I'm going to throw this thought at you and see what you each think about it. So let's see. We'll start in <clears throat> five seconds. All right, folks, time for the podcast bonus segment here on DM Radio, talking to a wonderful array of experts here, Timothy Spann and David Kierengard, both of Stream Native and Paul Brebner from InstaCluster. And uh, I'll throw it over to Tim and then David and then Paul, each comment on this yourselves. I'm curious to know your thoughts about this. Uh, this concept of a data-first architecture. So these new um, 
opportunities that we have now that we have all these technologies we could do things different ways there are there are all sorts of ways you can kind of start the process and i'm fascinated by this concept of a data first architecture where data is the first thing that that kicks off processes when this data is filled when it's null or whatever it'll start a set of processes around what happened because the data is obviously a representation of reality that's what we want the data represents some facet of the real world is it a person is it a car is it an object is it a bill or whatever <clears throat> but i'm just curious to hear what you guys think about this because of course the the challenge is you have all these legacy systems so how do we as tim suggested a moment ago retain all of that without incurring too much additional cost on maintenance and so forth but build around that and build new workflows right you have all these new ways to build workflows that are very interesting that pick up pieces of data and make decisions and do stuff it's fascinating stuff but uh, what do you just generally what do you think about that and uh, what are your thoughts tim well i think the the first thing you have to do is make sure everyone in your organization is on the same page give the same definitions for what data is Things like Pulsar have a schema registry, so you could evolve what data means over time. But someone has to start off with, yeah, this is what a customer looks like. And you, you have to at least have some kind of model. Certainly, there's a lot of flexibility in streaming. But what do you mean by a customer? What do you mean by an order? And, you know, have these defined so everyone's on the same page. Maybe you have one schema for it even if there's maybe it's very sparse, just so when you start creating that data and you launch the process, launching the process now with, you know, the modern streaming technologies like Pulsar and Kafka, that's not the difficult part. The part is what does this data look like? And, you know, how am I uh, going to define it and use it later? You know, what, what are the ranges of data? What's, what's valid, what's not valid, what's the range of data, you know, what do I want to do with it? Because pulling that off of a database with CDC, pulling it out of a log, pulling it off an event, pulling it out of a phone or having it pushed to the stream, we have hundreds and hundreds of sources to do that. So that's not the problem. Defining it, having everyone agree to it right, and making sure it's clean and ready to go, that takes a lot of people. That's the hardest process. <laughs> That's a good point, uh, David. I'll throw it over to you. And I, I'm trying to think of a concrete example of where this theory comes from. And think of so on a web app somewhere, someone comes in and opens an account, right? So they open an account that goes to a database somewhere, like if it's a banking account or something like that. It's pretty important stuff. There is going to be a latency on traditional processes for what to do with that. But if you have a streaming solution set up, to where the moment that account is created from the front end, it also sends an alert to the marketing people, to the admin, to the accountants or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because again, you even talked about it earlier, being able to compare streams and see, right? And that's, a, I know for sure from my old, from a past life in the banking world, um, closing accounts like the exceptions, exception management as they call it, that's the mm -hmm. hardest part of their job. When they're trying to close the books, it's all the stuff that doesn't fit into the boxes neatly that's difficult to manage. And that's what people spend all day working on is that stuff. So any additional signal you can give to your teams to help them make sure that it's valid, this is a new, it's a real new customer, it's not a bot, for example, it's not an error. That's all useful stuff. And, and to me, it gets pretty interesting because, especially over time, because people will start to realize, wait, so I can get a stream on this activity and that activity that starts to get pretty interesting. But what do you think about the, this whole concept of a data first architecture? Yeah, I actually like it. I think it, it maps back to a lot of the new emerging concepts we're seeing as far as microservices and event driven architecture, where, like you said, a single business event occurs and different organizations or parts of the organizations want to react to it independently. They all have their own a thing to act upon it. And so having that single source of truth stored somewhere and then triggering like an audit, a fraud detection for an event opening or you know, things like, you know, so my, my book, I use a, a, a food delivery application based on microservices using Pulsar functions and a, a, so a customer order gets placed. Well, restaurant, the restaurant needs to know about it. The driver needs to know about it. And there are all these events and then people dynamically subscribe to them. And then based on what you see in these values drives the whole business interaction, which is really models, you know, you know, real life quite, quite nicely, which is always a hard part of 
we, you know, in data science or, you know, computer science, we've always thrust these models upon what we, what reality looks like with object oriented programming, these other ways to sort of fit it in these boxes and it never fits nicely. So have an event that says, Hey, the driver that has your order is here. And then you can send that up there and then there can be a notification app that can send you alert to your phone that says, Hey, you know, your, your package is, is five minutes away. And it's a very, you know, native, simple, uh, you know, interface and it makes it easy for everybody to, uh, you know, stay in their domain. The data can get enriched. It can stay nice and, and smooth. And then you can decide what you want to, uh, consume or not consume and blend together. And it's, it's a, it's a really good approach, I think. And it fits nicely with those terms. Yeah, that that's cool. And, uh, Paul, I'll throw this one last question over to you. As I think about the value of open source and there's tremendous value that the open source community has brought. And one of the key values, it seems to me is that it mitigates the process of reinventing wheels, right? Because hitherto, everyone reinvented all their own wheels inside their, their IT department with their data center. And people were just reinventing wheels all day, all night. And that it's kind of solved some of those problems. And I kind of see the same thing here with streaming and data, because what happens? Everyone wants their own data. No, this is our internal data, first party data. I have my data set that I'm biased towards just because it's mine, et cetera. But the more we can share these streams of data that makes sense like like again weather data is a perfect example some of the stuff you're working on and and allow people to subscribe to that feed you're really uh, optimizing the time you spend i talked to someone just earlier today uh, the most precious commodity now and probably always has been but it really is time and i even say it's more than time it's energy and it's morale right and i see these as really boosting morale as well but what do you think about that uh, those concepts, Paul, in the in the context of a data first architecture. Um, yeah, lots of interesting ideas there. Could take an hour to unpack <laughs> even half of those. Um, yeah, look, at just picking up perhaps on the uh, the whole workflow idea and exceptions and time, trying to combine it together. So, with Kafka in particular, everything is just changing all the time. So it's really easy to build very complicated, loosely coupled systems where the data is just being transformed and reused for multiple purposes purposes and things but it's actually quite hard to keep a handle on the state of that whole system at that point um it's really good for things like pipelines where the data is constantly moving and you've got to be constantly responding and doing stuff to it but what do you do with the more traditional workflow say one where you're actually uh, which, which involves delivery drivers like an uber use case for the uber food for example well in fact I mean, it turns out there's actually a new technology a new open source technology that we've just actually made available as a managed service in the last few weeks, which is Uber Cadence. Hmm. So Cadence actually is a scalable workflow technology. It's uh, developer first, so it's basically designed so you actually write your workflow in Java with the support of the, the Cadence infrastructure. And it gives you all of the nice things you'd like to be able to do to, to manage and understand the state of things like deliveries, for example. And it's, it's all um, failure proof with the whole system breaks or or fails for whatever reason um it'll just restart automatically again um and it inc includes all the aspects of time and exception handling that you really need for workflow management as well which is quite hard to do in a pure streaming environment like kafka um, but it actually works really well it's complementary again which i think is a key thing of some of these open source technologies you don't have to choose one or the other um you can get kafka to work with with lots of things and so Cadence actually, in the last week, I've actually got Cadence to work with Kafka microservices. So you can actually send a message to Kafka, uh, call a microservice that you've perhaps got already in a system running in Kafka. It'll do some processing for you and then send the result back to Cadence and then trigger the next part of your workflow. So that's a really cool technology. I've only just started playing with that, but I think it has lots of potential as sort of a crossover technology. That is absolutely fascinating. Folks, I knew this was going to be a good show. It did not disappoint. Look all these folks up online, please. Tim Spann and David Kiramgard from Stream Native and Paul Brebner from InstaCluster. And send me an email, info at dmradio.biz. I'm always curious to know what you want to know. And if you want to be in the show, let me know. Info at dmradio.biz. I'm sure we'll see these gentlemen again in 2022, which is only two weeks away. We'll talk to you next time, folks.